So um, on this morning, aside from that praise interlude, that's good stuff, man. You can, I, I don't know about you, I can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can live off that, I can flow off that, but, um, um, but some of us need, we need, we give us that teaching too. You, you, it's cool to flow off that, but give us that teaching. Give me something I can, give me something I can practice. And so we are, um, we are as, as Reverend Boyd shared with us earlier, in the fourth, um, actually in the fifth lesson, but the fourth language of uh, Gary Chapman's um, book, The Love Languages. And uh, this book, I really do believe, holds within it some uh, very critical secrets to a lasting love. The uh, first three languages were was the word of, words of affirmation, quality time, and receiving gifts. And on today, our uh, language is acts of service, acts of service. And uh, I, you, you probably heard me say it before that in relationships, we have a tendency uh, to bring the patterns of our past, say patterns of our past. In relationships, we have a tendency to bring the patterns of our past into uh, our present. And those patterns are then applied in our relationships, and we apply them whether the patterns are beneficial and healthy or not. See, if you only know one way to do it, then you only know one way to do it. And so most of us learned how to communicate according to how we grew up. So we look to the cues that we saw from our parents. We look to the cues that we saw from our siblings, and that essentially shaped how we communicate in relationships. And then, as we mature through life, we learn additional ways to communicate in relationship. But that usually comes with some effort and intentionality. Because most of us are conditioned to do it the way we always saw it being done. But there is hope for those of us who will put the effort into learning uh, an additional language, particularly if we find that learning the language of our significant other is important to us. So you've already done it before. I'm guessing, um, as a matter of fact, by show of hands, how many of you communicate um, differently with your parents than you did when you were with your friends? All right, that's, that's, that's most everyone. And so we can, we can, when it suits us, we can learn the dialect of a particular language that gives us the ability to flow within the structure of the relationship that we're in. Are you with me? So then what I am suggesting is that when we want to, we can upset the patterns that we bring to a relationship and we can uh, learn, adopt, adapt and apply new languages if we find, say if, yeah. if we find the relationship important enough. And so if the relationship is important enough, we will take the time, the energy, and the effort to learn a language that gives us the ability to effectively communicate with those with which we are in relationship. I've said since this series began that there are six primary relationships. There is the God connection, the self connection. There is the significant other connection. There is the, the friend connection. There is the parent connection. There is the child connection. Each of those requires us to perhaps communicate differently when we are in relationship. Are you still with me? But our language for today is um, just a little bit tricky. Acts of service as a love language can be just a little bit tricky. See, acts of service speakers love the help you provide and they love providing help to you as a means by which to make your life or their life easier. Service talkers see acts of service as a help whether they know how to ask for it or not. Are you with me? 
And so service talkers may need your help even if they don't know how to ask for it. People need people. My daughter, when she was about five or six years old, um, one day she was preparing for school, she called me from the other room and she said, Dad, come help me tie my shoes. And I was probably busy trying to do whatever it was I was doing. And so I said to her, you're a big girl. You know how to tie your own self shoes. And she said to me, um, just because I know how to do it doesn't mean I don't want your help to do it. Acts of service speakers are very similar to that mindset. They can do it on their own, and many of them, because they can do it on their own, won't engage you to help them, but if you will help them, it will reaffirm their sense of love from you to them and from them to you. You with me? And so acts of service, folks, are um, a word we use around here. They're peculiar. They're peculiar because they don't think they need you, but they do. Now, here is the rub. It can get very gray when you have someone that you are in relationship with who is an acts of service speaker. Because if we go back to the patterns we were talking about, all of us grew up with um, what we might call gender roles. Are you with me? Meaning, the women did this, and the men did this. But when it comes to an acts of service speaker, you can think that you are doing service, but in their mind, you are not adding to their love tank because they might think it's your responsibility anyway. Are you with me? So, so, for instance, for instance, a husband can uh, spend his entire weekend, um, um, he, he can, he can, he can uh, winterize the lawn, he can uh, prepare the, the, the lawnmower for the winter season, he can wrap up the hoses and put them away for the winter, he can um, prepare the snowblower for the winter, he can winterize the cars. And if none of those things speak to her as an act of service, all he did was stuff he was supposed to do. <laughs> are, are you with me? Now, this same husband could bring home a jerk chicken for dinner. He could clean the kitchen when they were done. He could. <laughs> got a witness. He could put the children to bed after dinner. And then he could run her one of those Calgon take me away baths. And he would stack up major points because for her, that is speaking a dialect of acts of service. So now, now don't clap yet, because, because some of you may be think you're serving, you may be think you're speaking your significant other's language because you're doing what your role calls for, but you need to make sure you're getting credit. See, I don't know about you, if I do extra credit, I want the credit. And so then, for acts of service speakers, and for those of us who are in relationship with those who speak the acts of service love languages, on last week we said um, you could become a proficient gift giver, but acts of service is just a little bit more nuanced as a love language because the patterns that we bring to the relationship are always present and we may not know it. We good? So then, if we are in relationship with someone who speaks acts of service, it's important to also remember 
that an acts of service speaker will be inclined to communicate love through their acts of service. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because your love language may be a words of affirmation, or your love language may be quality time. And so um, he may come home and see that throughout the course of the day, um, the, the meal has not yet been prepared, and the children's toys are still in the floor, and the bed is not yet made up from this morning. And so because he speaks acts of service, he will come home and start to do those things as a communication of his love language. But while he's doing that, he will not be paying attention to you. Here is the rub. He will think he's loving you. You won't be feeling loved. Right? And so then we have to be able to make sure that when we are communicating with an acts of service speaker or an AOS speaker, not ASS, AOS. I want you to be real clear. Sometimes your O's and your S's can sound alike. When you are communing with, communicating with an AOS speaker, you have to be real clear and intentional and practical about what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. You can never, you should never, hear me, hear me, you should never do something for an acts of service speaker without her or him knowing that you did it. If you have an acts of service speaker, they will not think it's bragging if you say, I cut the grass for you. They will obviously notice it, right? But I wouldn't risk it. You should absolutely let an acts of service speaker know that you, I don't know if, hey baby, I don't know if you saw it, but I got out there and cut the grass. Yeah, my own, my own. Yeah, yeah, I did that. How do you like it? You want an acts of service speaker to know that you did the service. And so I'm saying that you have to watch what you do and how you do it so that your doing does not get overlooked. Because for an acts of service speaker, what you do is far more important than what you say. Are you with, are you with me? You're with me. So then, if you have an acts of service speaker, remember that he or she has a running to-do list in their head. Your acts of service speaker, they have a running to-do list in their head and they don't relax until their list is complete. If you have an acts of service speaker, remember that undone tasks tend to make an acts of service speaker or an AOS speaker anxious. And so they can, they can, uh, they can think that you are neglecting them because you have not yet gotten to what they were expecting to be done. Let me say it to you this way. They can think, you, you can be missing an opportunity to fill their love tank because they are missing what they expected to be done. So, how do you love an AOS speaker? Well, as I said, you tell them the things that you did. First, two, if you have an AOS speaker, you can help the relationship if you will identify the chores and the things that they don't like to do and do them. That's, what, that, that's, that's a very subtle amen. That ain't, that, ain't, that, ain't much, that ain't much A in the men. <laughs> You're like, it's his chores for a reason. 
but but see, but I, but I, I, here is here is here is what I want you to know. So when he has when he or she has a honeydew list, you all know what a honeydew list is, right? Yes, yes or no? Yeah. All right. So if they have a honeydew list and you want to optimize, now this is all optional. But if you want to optimize the filling of their love tank, find some things on that honeydew list that they are really waiting along to do. It might be it, it might be the task of cleaning the garage. But I'm telling you, you clean that garage for him, you got it going on. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't want to hear it. I don't care. <laughs> how do you how do you love how do you love an acts of service speaker, you pamper her or him. You pamper her or him. Uh, if, you, if your significant other is an acts of service speaker, when you go to the spa, instead of going with your girlfriend, take your acts of service guy. And y'all sit there together and get y'all mud mask and y'all massage and y'all manicure and y'all pedicure. I don't like that that much. <laughs> They're like, no, you try to take my time from my girlfriend. Oh, no, what I'm, try what I'm trying to help you see is that she can't be to you what he can. If, if, if you can get it right. If you can get it right. Now, he can't be to you what she can either, but he's not supposed to be. And she's not supposed to be. So, if you will, if that's it, so, so again, uh, that's why I'm telling you at the top, you have to re examine your preconceived notions and expectations about the gender roles that you're bringing to the relationship because you're setting up patterns, and patterns are always um, a point of prophecy in that a pattern can tell you how a thing is going to end up. So at the beginning, you can know how it's going to end. Are you with me? So then, um, if, if you are an acts of service speaker, if you are an acts of service speaker, here is what I want to challenge you to do. If you are an acts of service speaker, particularly if you are finding that, that your tank is not being filled appropriately. So if you are an acts of service speaker and you are not feeling loved in the relationship, I want to challenge you to do what the master teacher says. I want to challenge you to ask. I want to challenge you to ask. Because if, if the master teacher is right, then if we ask, we can expect to receive. If we ask, we can expect to receive. So we have to be willing to ask for what we want. In relationships, all kinds of relationships, for all of the primary relationships, it is important to have the courage to ask for what you want. As a matter of fact, most of us, most people, most people, maybe not you, but most people, their asking muscle is underdeveloped. Right? So most of us don't know how to ask. Now, they say that if you do ask, there is a 200% better chance that you will receive it. And if you don't ask, the chances are almost zero that you will receive it. So I just want to quickly take you through the barriers of asking. There are five major barriers to asking. First, number one, the number one barrier to asking, and these are not necessarily in order, but the number one barrier to asking is just simply ignorance. Most of us in relationship don't know what we want. As a matter of fact, when, whenever I'm asked by someone to mentor them or to coach them, the very first thing I ask them is, how can I be of support to you? Almost every time I've asked that question, the person says, I don't know, let me think about it. So, they, so they've thought enough, judge, to ask, but they don't know what they need. And so I can't support you if I don't know what you need. 
It's probably the same thing with your significant other. Let me be the first to break the news to you. They are not psychic mind readers. They don't know what you want if you haven't communicated that. And to lessen your frustration even more, if you don't know what you want, how in the world can they? Are you with me? So I want to encourage you to just get clear and concise about what it is you want from your relationships. We want to be intentional about our relationships. Is that right? The second thing, the second barrier to our ability to ask is just limiting and inaccurate beliefs. Can I, can, now, you, you, you're, a different, you're a different crowd. You're a different crowd. You've been, you've been uh, trained differently. You've been taught differently. So, so this might not apply to you. But most people don't ask because they don't believe they deserve it. So what that looks like in relationship is you will settle for something beneath what you deserve because you believe you deserve less than what you might be getting. Are you with me? Don't leave me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Because belief dictates our effort, our enterprise, and our actions. Is that right? And so many of us have learned from our mistakes that we ought not ask for the things we want. Sometimes we're just too embarrassed to ask. It's like when you were in school and you had a question. The teacher was explaining, but you still had a question. And you know you need to get clear on it because you might see it on the test, but you won't raise your hands because you think somebody else is going to think you, you, you're not smart because you asked that question. That's one thing. It's, it's one thing to do that when you are in grade school. It's quite another to go through life unwilling to ask for what you need because you don't believe you deserve it. Are you with me? I just want to give it to you. I want to give it to you. Um, the third, the third, one of the third primary reasons why people don't ask for what they need is fear. Listen to this. Holding on to fear is a uniquely human feature. I can, I can run, de deers will, deers come to my yard. And don't tell anybody else, but um, I, 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 I found a way to, to ward them off. Not sure it's completely legal, but I do it anyway. <laughs> and and to, if there are any animal lovers, please give me some grace and forgiveness. <laughs> and so whenever I do whatever I do, it, it, it scares the deers. It, sca it will scare them away. But they don't hold on to that fear. They come back <laughs> for what they want. People are the only creation, humans are the only creation who hold on to and store the fear and allow the fear from living them the kind of empowered lives they know they were created to live. And so if fear is keeping you from asking, I don't care if they told you no a hundred times, you get up and you ask one more time because it only needs one person to say yes to helping you fulfill the desire you want. So don't continue to accumulate the fear and store it and use it as something that keeps you from having what you want. Barbara DeAngelis, Barbara DeAngelis, not Derek Wells. Say not Derek Wells. But Barbara DeAngelis says that she thinks that this is one of the primary things that has impacted women throughout generations, right? She says, Every, she says, I think every time a woman asks for what she wants, she has to go to war against thousands of years of genetic programming. She says, it is very, very deeply ingrained. And I'm saying to you, your genetic programming can be reprogrammed if you will have the courage and the tenacity to move past your fear so that you can walk in your faith. Are you with me? The fourth barrier, the fourth barrier that stands in the way for most people and prevents them from asking from what they want in relationships that they've said yes to. I want you to get that. We won't ask for what we want 
in relationships that we've said yes to. The fourth barrier is low self-esteem. Now again, this is a unique crowd, and so you might be different. It might not be you. Um, but if you go to lunch with two other people this afternoon, and there are three of you all, the chances are that two of the three lack the appropriate level of self-esteem. So not you, <laughs> but it could be one of the two people you go to lunch with. The fifth thing that, that stands in our way, the fifth thing that stands in our way, and this is, is pervasively more so for men. Oftentimes, pride stands in the way of our asking for what we need. Pride stands in the way, men, from our asking for what we need. We don't want to seem weak. We don't want to seem vulnerable. We don't want it to look like we don't have it all together. Here is the fact of the matter. Nobody knows all of what they need to know about all of what it is they are trying to do. And they say the sign of genius is asking for the help you need. And so I want to just challenge you men, women, wherever you are, if you are in relationship, don't let your pride keep you from having the people that you are in relationship with give you what you need. Ask for what you want because if you can ask in the right spirit, you can accelerate your receiving. Are you with me? I'm going to close with this, a story by Steve Parker. He said about seven years ago, he started a small restaurant. And as he was in this business, he was unable to get the decor of the restaurant the way he wanted it to be. He was not able to hire the right chef. He was not able to hire the right staff. And so two years after he started the business, he wound up going bankrupt. And he had a resource in his father. But because of his ego and because he wanted to prove all that he could do it all on his own, because he wanted to prove that he could do it all on his own, he didn't reach out to his father. And what he said that decision taught him was that it didn't teach him that he could do it on his own. What it taught him was that he didn't have the courage to ask for what he needed. And so if you are someone who speaks the language of acts of service, I want to challenge you to ask for what you need. If they are good enough to be in relationship with you, they better be good enough to give you what you need. God bless you.